Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, we have the amazing Elaine Fraze joining us again. Welcome, Elaine. Glad to be here. I am so excited to have you back as part of our fall book series, where we here at the Impact Farming Show are shining a spotlight on agriculture authors and their amazing work. Today, we're going to be chatting about your book, Farming's, Farming's In-Law Factor. So are you ready? i uh, love to be ready. The book was published first in uh, June of 2014, six short years ago. And um, I'd love you to hold the cover up a bit longer. I have a copy here beside me too. But um, I just want to explain about the brown egg. Hashtag on Twitter, I am the brown egg. And that's what uh, a lot of daughter-in-laws have told me. So that cover cost me $425 to get that beautiful picture, but it's very apropos. And it's very sharp. It's a sharp book and a great book too. I've read through it and I am the daughter-in-law. So there's, there's some really great stuff in there covering all the in-laws, the farm communication. You know what? This is really golden for every farm family member. Really well, the reason, the reason we wrote the book, Tracy, and I must uh, give due credit to Dr. Megan McKenzie, who is a, a close friend of mine, has her PhD in conflict resolution. And when she graduated with her PhD from Trinity University in Dublin, Ireland, and came back to Canada, she hadn't really published a lot. And I said, oh, I can help you with that. And so we did the book together and spent many hours in this very office and did tons of research. So I'm very proud of how the book came together. It's got an annotated bibliography. It's indexed. And my heart's desire was to see it um, not only on the toilet tank of every farmhouse bathroom in Canada, which is an interesting measure of success. <laughs> But, you know, where do farmers read? But now, of course, they read on auto, audio or they listen to audio books. And someday soon I want to get this converted also into audio. But Dr. McKenzie and I um, did tons of research all across the world. And there's very, very little written about farming's in-law factor. The other thing that happened is as I was doing presentations on farm transition, very often someone would be, you know, standing back at the room, and then he'd come up to me and say, Elaine, can we talk? And I go, yeah. And he'd say, I have a problem. And I looked at him and I said, what's her name? And he said, how did you know? I said, well, I've been around a little while. And, and his, his concern was, how do we get the daughter-in-law to move to our farm where all the action is? And so I have this great phrase from Susan Forward's book on emotional blackmail called, Where Is It Written? Where is it written that because you work on a farm, you have to live on the farm? And of course, we'll get into this as we do this conversation, but there's just such a myriad of factors. And so Dr. McKenzie and I spent a year of Tuesdays in this office, writing this book, researching, talking to people. We did a survey of, of my entire list and got 240 responses of what the key challenges were on their farm. And then we would phone some of those people and say, do you mind if we interview you anonymously? So it, it's very well researched, but it's also very practical and very helpful with a lot of tools. And there is some humor in it because we hired um, a woman to be our cartoonist to give it some lightness too, because it's a really tough topic. It is. And actually, it's funny you say that about the cartoon because one of the pages that I have flagged off here, I have to okay. bring it up. Right here, oh, it's yeah. a husband and a wife, and then beside them are two families, and they're going, right. we do, we do. Right. And <laughs> yeah, as exactly. I mature and I'm part of a family, and thankfully they're an amazing family, mm -hmm. but you look around at some individuals that have challenges with in-laws and siblings, and if I was to give words of wisdom to a younger me, I would say you're not marrying just that person. Exactly. Look around, date the family because that's who you're marrying. 
And oh, when I opened it up, I found that cartoon and I, I had to share it because there's, it's just so smart. Well, and again, we, another place we do say, where is it written? Or what are the unwritten family rules, Tracy? And as, as you dated Anthony, you probably found out things about him that you go, oh, we don't do it that way in our family. But, you know, you're, you're joining two families together. And I, I have brought my little rings with me today, which I always carry with me when I'm speaking. And this is the family circle, which is the heart. And it's red to stand for the love and nurture and what you should be getting from your family. And this is the green circle, which is the profitable farm business, right? But in farming's in-law factor, what happens is it kind of all gets mushed together. And so it's always a bit of a dance how you separate these two family systems. And even just understanding that will be helpful so that when you're, you're doing the conflict, you go, is this about my, my, my uh, role on the farm? Or is this about your ex expectations that when we come to Thanksgiving, I can't buy a pie at Costco. It has to be home baked. <laughs> oh boy. Amen to that. <laughs> oh. I'm the, I'm going to work till about half an hour before the family event, swoop in with my purchased item. And it is funny in this day and age still, yeah. that is, that's just, it doesn't, uh, yeah. it doesn't count if it didn't come from the oven. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I always say their pie is probably better than my pie. <laughs> and it's the thought that counts. <laughs> <laughs> or else you could just stop bringing pie and bring something easier that doesn't have judgment around it. But, you know, again, that's, that's a fun example, yeah. but it has deep, <clears throat> it has deep implications. Uh, when you speak to a young woman with tears in her eyes and says, and she's saying, Elaine, I've been in this family for six, seven years or whatever. And we have young children now. And no matter what I do, I never feel like I'm part of this family. When am I going to be part of this family? Ouch. And, that, and that's, a, that's a big ouch. And I'm very blessed. I dedicated the book, I must mention this, to two moms. I dedicated it to two strong women, to my mother and to um, my mother-in-law. And I'll just uh, go to the dedication page here quickly. If I can find it. To courageous farm families who are ready to talk, act, and create an amazing legacy. And then Megan dedicated it to her feisty grandmothers and grandmothers-in-law. And I was able to write this book because I had a mother-in-law who treated me as if I was her daughter. So I called her mom from the day I got married, which some people may think of maybe is odd. But the reality is, is that I knew I was going to be living close to her in her world and three hours away from my own mother. So I... I was very clear about the kind of relationship I wanted to have with her right from the get go. You know, that's amazing. And so intentional too. Yeah. Okay. So I, I kind of let the cat out of the bag in the fact that the book is not only for the in-law factors, but can I read a few of the quick chapter names here so that sure. our audience gets a good idea? They might go, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not a daughter-in-law. It's not yeah. just for daughter-in-laws. It really isn't. Chapter one, I mean, we don't need to go through it all, but the culture of agriculture and rural communities, and there's some good stuff in there for people that don't know, moving, right? And then it goes daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law. And you have, a, I skimmed through all the chapters last night, and there's some really good wisdom in there. And I was going, oh yeah, that would be what they're thinking, right? So... Why don't you take it away and tell me a little bit more about the book and some of your favorite lessons? Well, I think, I think what would be helpful to the audience, Tracy, is just to understand how what you just read in terms of mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, father-in-law, how their roles are different or what each person needs. So let's start with the daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-laws are coming into a family system and into a farm that's different from the one they grew up on, or if they grew up in the city, like my daughter-in-law, which I think is great. My daughter-in-law and I have a great relationship, and, and she loves agriculture, but she asked me this question. She said, Elaine, why do people stop talking to me when I tell them I'm from the city? Oh. I said, oh, Kendra, that's easy. They're just judging you. <laughs> And, you know, she would meet people in the grocery store and she was engaged to her son and they'd say, well, you know, you're, you're from the city. And so 
nobody wants to live in a, in a cycle of, of judgment. So daughter-in-laws mostly are looking for respect and they're also looking for a voice at the table because I love to frame daughter-in-laws as fresh eyes. They come with a totally new perspective. And in a lot of cases, daughter-in-laws are highly educated. They have a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. Uh, they're pea eggs. They go out, they do crop agronomy. They come back and then they're told they can't contribute anything to this farm business. And I go to the farming founders and I go, give your head a shake. You're cutting off a whole bunch of possibility. So the respect is really important. And, and another thing that's related to the farming in-law factor, Tracy, that we may or may not discuss fully is the fear of divorce. Oh. So lately I've had phone calls where the man says, I'm having trouble with my outlaws. And I say, stop right now. Don't you ever use that language ever again. Strike that from your vocabulary. Because what he's done is he's framed his daughter-in-law as an outlaw. And how would you like to be called that? And it's not funny. It's that kind of sarcasm and dark humor is not helpful to the family. Well, so you know stop that it. That they're thinking. And that's well, exactly. Because they're already, and I, I call that, I think you and I have talked about this before when we talked about conflict a long time ago, is that conflict filter that's right in front of his face. I have decided never to like this woman that my son has married. Bad decision. Because the best way to prevent divorce on the farm is love and respect. And I have a blog that you can search on my website called How to Prevent Divorce on the Farm, and there's 14 things you need to think about. So the other thing the daughter-in-law is really concerned about is not only having a voice, but it's also about her, her sense of certainty. So what happens to her if her husband dies or gets disabled on the farm? What kind of financial transparency does she have to know that she's well taken care of? And in our family, we've discussed divorce with our coach because we had to have the conversation. So our daughter-in-law knows that if their marriage falls apart, which we pray it doesn't, and we work hard for that not to happen, that if something falls apart, we've made agreements with her that she will never be destitute or kicked out of her house or whatever. So she's very clear that in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, whatever happens, she is always going to be loved, respected, and supported. And that's a huge foundation. Well, yeah. Wouldn't you want that from everybody in your family? Right? We want that. But you know what, Elaine? I have very rarely heard that. Well, That's amen. Amazing. You know, we got to walk the talk, right? If I'm going to be a farm family coach and, and I'm looking out my front window, I, I'm, standing, I'm, I'm standing in front of my desk where I typically work on my computer, Tracy. So out my front window is my neighbor's field. Over there is another field. Every farm that touches my land, our land on this farm, is divorced. Four divorces. And some of them were after 32 years of marriage. And that's what scares farmers. That's why they come up to me after seminars and they go, Elaine, what do we do to make sure there's no divorce in our farm? My, my daughter-in-law is just so different from us and I can't seem to figure her out. Well, here's my, here's my encouragement. Start having family meetings. Start having a talking stick. Here he is. He always shows up. Hi. And and start passing the bull around and getting that transparency. So the daughter-in-law really wants, and she also needs some privacy, right? Because I am living in my mother-in-law's house, Tracy, like 90% of the farm family community across the prairies. Yeah. When I was the home economist, here's another funny story. She came to my office and she said, oh, hi, Miss Edie. I would like you to come to our house and help me pick out the wallpaper and the carpet because we're moving back to the farm. They'd been away for five years and we're doing this renovation. I said, sure, I, that's part of my job description. So I had some design background from my home ec degree. Well, wouldn't you know, I picked out a carpet and wallpaper and little did I know that I'd be marrying her son in two years. And I lived with that carpet for 29 years. Really liked the carpet. Not so much on the wallpaper. So I took the wallpaper down. But we lived in this house for 11 years without owning it before we had our farm transition in 1992. And when Grain News readers read that, they went, oh my goodness, Elaine, your life is just like ours. I said, you think? 
right? And so it's that, it's that knowing. And so one of the great things about reading books about the culture of agriculture is you start to understand that, oh my goodness, I am not alone. But I don't, want to pe- I don't want people to stay sad and alone. I want them to think, what are the steps I need to take to get in a better space? That is one of the things I love most about podcasts, YouTube videos, books. Yeah. When I started my business journey, you'd have these thoughts and concerns and fear and you go, well, what's wrong with me? Why do I feel this way? Then you open up and start learning. You go, oh, I'm not alone. Right. And the feeling and the reassurance that comes from that and work like this is just unbelievable. So who do you want to talk about next? The mother-in-law, the father-in-law, or the (laughs) son-in-law? Let's talk about the mother-in-law. Okay, that would be me. Okay. (laughs) You know this one. (laughs) You know this one. I I live this one every day. Okay, so I have one daughter-in-law and no other married children. So that's probably going to be it. So the mother-in-law is caught in what I call a triangle because the mother-in-law has the son coming in this year and saying, you would not believe what dad just did. And then she's got her husband coming in the other ear saying, why did we do this? Why did we think this was a good idea? And so she's quite often, uh, I had this one Dutch dairy farmer that I love her dearly in uh, Fraser mainland. She said, Elaine, I'm the pig in the middle. I said, Oh, you want to call yourself a pig? Okay. So, <laughs> So anyway, I gave her a magnet. I gave her a pig magnet for her fridge just so she'd remember that she didn't have to be the pig in the middle. But in conflict resolution, we call, we call this a triangle. And so the mother-in-law typically gets caught between the son and the father. And then she probably also has another ear for the daughter-in-law because the daughter-in-law is coming over and saying, you know, I, this is not working. And so she has a very interesting role. And the University of Iowa did a study that we talk about in the book they're one of the things that the mother-in-law really has to do is cut the apron strings. And some mothers don't. And I know of many or several where they're always kind of getting into the life of their son and they haven't launched them and, you know, done the leave and cleave kind of thing. <laughs> so it's a really good thing as a mother. And so here's my key question for mother-in-laws. When you're in this situation with your son, your, your husband or the daughter-in-law, your daughter-in-law, one of a really helpful question would be, what would you like me to do differently? So for instance, it's always better if I text my daughter-in-law, who lives, by the way, 50 steps across the shelter belt down the grandma path. And she broke my half mile rule because I did, I did have a rule that I've written about called don't live any closer to your in-laws than half a mile. And so she very quietly came to me and she said, mom, I want to break your half mile rule. And I say, why? She said, well, I don't really like your house. Your kitchen's too small. You have water in the basement sometimes. And um, you don't have an en suite. <laughs> I counted. It's 10 steps from my bed to the bathroom, but that's a side point. Anyway, my house wasn't suitable <laughs> for what she wanted. So she wanted the new house. So she got the new house next door. But you can imagine the kind of boundaries that you need to have as a mother-in-law for not bursting out over there to see my three adorable grandchildren. And I'm wearing my necklace today, which you can't quite see. Here it is that says grandma, which is one of my favorite roles, but I have many roles on my farm. So as a mother-in-law, you need to be emotionally mature. You need to not cause drama. You need to not have family gossip and you need to ask what's working for you and what's not. What would you like me to do differently? Because I believe Tracy that we get the behavior that we accept. So if you have a mother-in-law that you think is interfering, ask, why do you keep asking to get my groceries for me? And the mother-in-law will say, well, Tracy, I'm just trying to help. You're really busy with impact farm marketing and and you got tons of stuff to do. So I'm going to pick up groceries for you in Steinbeck and just make your life easier. And you go, oh my goodness. Because the frame the daughter-in-law had was, she's so nasty and interfering. You wouldn't believe my mother-in-law. And I had this actually happen in Saskatchewan, where after I interviewed the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, I got them in the same room and I said, could you just please share your intention with each other? Mm -hmm. And they ended up crying, which is helpful. But they also ended up hugging each other because they finally understood they were making very wrong assumptions. 
Mm. So, you know, mother-in-laws I've got here, they don't want to be the referee anymore. And I have a referee sweater I sometimes hold up when I'm speaking. They don't want to be the media. They just want family harmony. They just want people to get along. And they're, they're tired of being in the middle, Tracy. So my encouragement to farm mother-in-laws is first of all, get really clear about what you need. I work from this office and have for the last 39 years. I've been a, a, you know, a, pup, a professional speaker, coach, mediator, writer from this very space for almost 40 years. So I come here to work. But this morning, I saw my daughter-in-law walking by with the chariot pushing her two children, the other one's in nursery school this morning. And every morning she walks by and I go, oh, I'm so blessed to have family so close. But it's difficult when that relationship is not connected and when it's like this, right? So we get to choose our response. We get to ask powerful questions. And then we get to listen to what the other person is thinking, feeling, needing, and wanting. So if you're not in a great relationship with your daughter-in-law or son-in-law right now, take a look at yourself first. Amen. Mm -hmm. And you know, the mother-in-law, I think out of all, I mean, we, we need all the positions, right. positions, family members to go around and do their part. But the mother-in-law, that is such a crucial role. And more and more, I see that they can really set the tone for the right, family. Absolutely. Unit, right? That would be the phrase, that'd be the exact phrase that I would use. And when you talk about the culture of agriculture, I have a presentation called Culture Beats Strategy, which I'm going to be doing for the Pacific Ag Show in January, virtually, of course. And it's about what we believe to be true, how we behave, and how we show up. And I think uh, last year we did, you and I did a whole video on that. And so people can go back and dig into that deeper. So Love. who's next? Okay, let's go to father-in-law. Okay, let's call this don't beat up dad. Okay, often when I'm speaking at seminars that the dads come and they go, oh, Elaine, I feel like I'm, I'm not, you know, doing the right thing. I said, don't beat yourself up. You're, if you have the intention of showing up and doing the best you can, that's what you're doing. But the hard part for fathers and founders is the ability, Tracy, to let go. To let go of the things in transition. So we're talking labor management and ownership. But there's also a letting go of we need to do it my way or the highway kind of thinking, right? And a lot of father-in-laws are very close. They don't share their emotions freely and it's, they're hard to read. And so that creates communication blockages. So my father-in-law, I use him as an example. When I got home from being so sick when I had postpartum depression, I'd been in a, a psych ward for most of 1984. My father-in-law was talking at me, but he was talking at me as he was walking away. And I went, stop. And he went, oh my goodness, Elaine is yelling at me. Well, I, I used a firm Irish tone voice. Anyway, he turns around and I said, I just need you to know that I've been in group therapy and I've done a lot of work on how to communicate better. And I need you to know that when you have a conversation with me, you need to be, I need to see your eyeballs. So from now on, Abe, this is how we're going to communicate. And he looked at me and he said, got it, Elaine, good to go. And so sometimes you have to uh, understand that your communication style is not helpful. So father-in-laws need to have the ability uh, to let go. I mentioned respect. So when is the last time you told your son or your daughter-in-law that you love them, you're proud of them, and that you appreciate everything and all the skills that they've brought to your family and to your farm? And again, we've talked about another video podcast, Tracy, about the love languages. And so if you knew that your father-in-law's love language was acts of service, like my husband's is, then going to clean his pickup truck or bringing him warm meals to the field or doing stuff for him will make him feel appreciated. But my curiosity is, does he know what you need to feel appreciated, right? 
Yeah. And, and what else have I got down here? Um, the other thing is not, not judging things. It has to be my way. And so in, in Discuss the Undiscussable, I talk about curiosity. So here's, <laughs> we had a trainee from Switzerland in 1991. His name was Simon and it was a late spring. So we got him to paint our house blue. We did not yet own said house. We were still in succession planning. And my father-in-law shows up and he goes, why are you painting the house blue? This house is supposed to be brown. And we go, oh, where is that written? I didn't get that memo. And so again, the ability to say, he could have approached it differently and say, I'm just curious, why are you painting this house Wedgwood blue? And I'd say, well, dad, because it's 1991 and that's the color of choice. You know, so coming from curiosity rather than, rather than this judgmental attitude, and people know in their spirit, in their heart, Tracy, when they're being judged. So what else have I got down here? I, um, also, this is not my farm anymore. This is our farm. So when is the father-in-law going to shift his language around, this is an amazing business that we're building together, right? So there, there's a lot of language. And again, I said, please do not call the in-laws, the outlaws. So watch your language, watch your behavior. Remember, you always get to choose your response. And the other thing I would love father-in-laws to do is to invite everyone to the communication table to have a voice. Because again, what if that in-law has just an amazing business idea that takes you to the next level? I love it. I sometimes wonder, Elaine, is there going to be, is there a generational difference? And is this going to get easier with different generations? Because I look at okay. my grandfather and Anthony's dad, and sometimes I get frustrated and go, they're not that person. They're maybe shy, more introverted. Can you even expect that from them where Anthony and hopefully the next generations might be a little bit better is it? <laughs> no, what, random? That's an interesting, crazy, you know, Tracy, I think that's why I'll never be out of work. I'm going to have an interview, a coaching call this afternoon with a man who is very um, closed. And I'm probably one of the few facilitators that's been able to draw him out. But uh, Kelly and Patterson wrote a book called Crucial Conversations, which I recommend everybody getting the audio book and listening to that. He talks about silence being a form of violence. And, and, no, but that's not acceptable in 2020 agriculture. You, you have to be able to communicate well in order to create solutions and build growth, right? And for everyone to feel that they matter and that people are retained and that everybody's appreciated. So I just really think that it's important for father-in-laws not to, not to leave them label themselves and say, quite often these older farmers that an older is to me is 60 plus and really old to me is 90. So let's get clear. I'm 63. I'm not old, but I am getting older. We all are. But when a farmer, a man typically says to me, Elaine, I'm a really bad communicator. I said, you used to be. Mm. I said, you're going to get better because I believe as a coach that everybody gets to get better and learn more skill and especially about intent, action, effect. So intent is in my head. You have no idea what I'm thinking about right now, Tracy, until I get it out and speak it. And then once I speak it, then you get to evaluate what effect your words or your actions have had on me. And then I can loop it back to you. And I ask people, what drives you crazy about communication on your farm? And quite often the answer is, Elaine, we don't know what the next generation or the older generation is thinking. We have no idea. And, you know, I, I've been coaching this young farmer in Alberta, and we had a great session yesterday. He listened to the book by Dr. Henry Cloud called Necessary Endings, and he said, Elaine, what was so helpful to me about that is I have very closed private parents. But Dr. Cloud talks about necessary endings and what to do when things don't work out, which is actually Chapter 10 of Farming's In-Law Factor. So we, we use some of his research to put a framework around what do you do when things aren't working out? And what this young farmer decided to do is not to worry about the fact that his parents were very closed, 
but he decided to tell them the consequences of their behavior and that they responded to. So he's, yes. Yeah. That's what I was getting at. Cause I'm sitting here thinking of some of the scenarios generation and I could almost hear the audience going, well, that's great. I'm the in-law or Mm -hmm. I can't communicate with my parents. How do I even start this conversation? But if they want to communicate, it's as easy as you're not telling me what is going on. So if I can't figure this out, we're going to have to go farm somewhere else. And that's exactly what this young farmer did. And he said, here's the deal. Either you move off the main yard and build your dream little sweet home somewhere on another part of the property, or I am leaving. And so those are the options. And all of a sudden, five years of stalemate, stalemate broke through because now the parents are starting to design their new house. Okay. And, 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 and it wasn't a threat. Threats are, are empty emotional consequences where you, you say something, but everybody knows you don't really mean it or that you're not going to follow through. But the reason I love Dr. Henry Cloud's work, he's also the guy who wrote the book on boundaries. And so when we wrote Farming's In-Law Factor, we also talk about boundaries. And so, you know, is this a business issue, like the little circles I held up, or is it, is it a family issue? And, and do we have separate kinds of meetings for that? Like, do we have regular farm business meetings? Or do we have family meetings um, the day after Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever to talk about what our goals are for our family? And I, I remember this amazing family in High River, Alberta, where we met in a hotel room. And it was their tradition, Tracy, to meet every year in the fall after harvest and do a celebration of the end of harvest, but also to celebrate the family and all the, all the great things that had happened on the farm. And Dr. Nikki Gerard's work from Saskatoon, she's a wonderful psychologist who wrote a study, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger, which is an interesting title. <laughs> and her, her, my first book, Planting the Seed of Hope, was was organized around her research because strong families celebrate strong families connect are connected to community and to each other and strong families communicate and again if you if you're dealing like you can also imagine the women who've been on a farm for 40 to 45 years and they're ready to get off of grand central station and i look at the husband and i go when is it her turn to get what she needs. And then he looks at me and he says, Elaine, you are so fired. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because, because they don't want to be asked those kinds of hard questions, Tracy, because I, you know, and we need to talk about the son-in-law. So I also have son-in-laws who gave up trades like carpentry or electrician, whatever, came back to a dairy farm. And this one son-in-law, I haven't heard from him lately, but I'd love to know how he's doing married a dairy farmer. She's an amazing herds person, manages this dairy, amazing. But they had been waiting for 11 years for the shareholders agreement to be signed. And the accountant was pushing for it. I'm pushing for it. And, and my curiosity is, why? Why is this not being documented? And there's the son-in-law's problem. He comes in as an outsider, at first typically as an employee to the business, or maybe not. Maybe he does something totally separate. But regardless, he's an employee. When does he turn to a shareholder? And that's a very awkward conversation to have with a founder who's not your father. He's your father-in-law, right? And so, right. But again, if you treat the farm as a business, a business is a business, and you put the people in the roles that are best for that role, not just because of the eldest child or whatever. So son-in-laws, they deserve their own chapter in this book as well. And I also, um, he, he's, he's in a rock and a hard place too because he, he wants to stay married. Divorce is not what he wants. And yet he doesn't, he doesn't feel that he's empowered to have a strong voice at the business decision table. So again, you see how it always circles back to that family business meeting and giving people voice because when people have voice and respect and they feel like they're being heard, then everybody's going to have a lot better harmony and getting along, I think. Thank goodness we have Elaine Fraze, Farm Family Coach. Wow. Yeah. And books like this. 
I am going to put the link up. As you know, we'll put it in the show notes. And if you're watching, I highly recommend whatever position, position, I'm calling no, it Whatever role, role you're in. <laughs> you can tell I'm always in the job mind frame. Whatever role you are on the farm, they're, this, it's just so important. And you know what I love, Elaine, too? We have now, and our frustrations, maybe as my generation working with the founders, but one of the things I'm always thinking about, if we're frustrated with how it's going, we probably all have kids that are coming yes, up. Absolutely. Let's we gotta work on the now and transitioning that farm. But my big thing is you can't control over there. But one day, hopefully, if it all goes well, you're gonna be in that seat. And how are we gonna do it better so that we don't repeat a lot of the mistakes and challenges? And I, I also want to mention too, Tracy, the way we set the book up is we also put a toolbox in it. So, you know, you can, you can really skim to the toolboxes and say, here's some concrete things that will help. Like, and there's a chart in there for mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws for what roles you want to do and what roles you don't want to do. So where is it written that farm women have to have a garden? Oh, and when I said that at Connect Ag, when we used to have that lovely conference in Saskatchewan, <laughs> nine women came up to me afterwards and said, Elaine, I just told my father-in-law I'm not having a garden anymore. And I go, oh, wow, what have I started? But, you know, they just needed permission that different is not wrong. It's just different. And, you know, I'm growing a garden because I like fresh carrots and spinach and Swiss chard and all that good stuff. And I have a happy story to tell you that in this year of 2020, I'm very proud of my son and daughter-in-law. They decided to buy sweet corn and plant eight rows of it along the edge of our field corn close to Boys Vane. And Wes and I figured out there's 20,000 cobs of corn in that patch. And it just got ready for Labor Day long weekend. And we put it out on social media. And we've had hundreds, literally hundreds of families come more than once to get corn. And they go, we never, we never we've never picked corn off a cob before. And, and so it's been a delightful, fun experience in the heaviness of the season that we're all in. So I just wanted to, to, to put that out there because my daughter-in-law told me the other day that my husband wasn't very clear about why we were doing this because to him, he thought it should be a business proposition. Like, how are we going to make money on this? But my son and daughter-in-law's expectation was this is going to be a gift of generosity to the community and something good to have happen in 2020. So, you know, not that my husband was wrong. He had a different intent, but my son's intent was very clear. And when he posted the Facebook page, he said, these are the rules. Please look out for the badger holes, which there's a lot. And secondly, please do not resell this corn. This is for the enjoyment of everyone. And so therein lies another lesson, to, uh, Tracy, is what rules or expectations are we making very clear? And the clearer our expectations are, the less conflict we're going to have because conflict happens when there's a disconnect between people's expectations. Yeah. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity to get farming in law factor back on the radar of farm families. And um, I'm easy to find. And I have other books coming out this fall as well, Farm Family Insights. Coach Insights. And again, I just keep writing in Grain News. And after five years goes by, another book comes out. But what's different about Farming's In-Law Factor is if anyone from a university or an ag college is listening to this podcast or this video, please reach out to me because the University of Manitoba has invited me in the past to speak. And I want everyone in communications ag classes mm -hmm. to have a copy of this book. Because if you can get ready to go into a family situation in a healthy way, <laughs> why not get off to a good start, right? It would be so much better to have a good start. Elaine, that's amazing. And you know, you just hit the nail on the head on one of my biggest burning passions in life. One of the things I find the most important thing in life is communication. Yeah. And when it comes to farm families and farms falling apart, I'm going to guess a lot of the time it's communication. It's not because you planted the wrong variety of seed. I mean, financials are different, but when things go bad and your heartache in life is normally communication. And where are we truly, truly taught 
how to effectively communicate with farm, not, not farm families only, but family members, right? Mm -hmm. We get what we grew up with. So I love the fact that you're trying to put this in university kids' hands yeah. because that's where they need to learn these things and come in with fresh habits, right? And the ebooks are all my ebooks are all my books are on ebooks. Um, my first book that I, I, I published in 2006 won two awards and it's out of print now. I still have people asking me if they can reprint Do the Tough Things Right. But all and Building Your Farm Legacy is also now an audio book. So one of my books is an audio book. So if you don't have time to read, you could start with that one. But people know how to find me. Just go to farmfamilycoach.com and uh, or use my name, elainephrase.com, and I'm here to help. And by the way, I'm not getting on a plane. <laughs> this is my this is my grounding spot. I'm thinking Tracy for at least another year and a half. You know, so I have no idea. I think it's going to be a little bit longer than we all originally thought. And I know you've been busy and you're doing a lot of virtual presentations too, which is a gift to agriculture. So if anybody out there wants to work with Elaine, find out more, have Elaine present at a virtual event, wow, do, do yourself a gift and have Elaine share her wisdom. And, and also for young farmers, I'm going to be uh, virtually in Newfoundland on November the 10th uh, with the Newfoundland Young Farmers, and they're opening it up to uh, the Federation of Agriculture in Newfoundland. So, you know, the other nice thing about doing these calls and video is that we've captured this conversation, and now you can go back and you can listen to it again more, more, more quietly in your own space and really pick out the threads that have, have meaning and purpose for you. And I'm, uh, I'm working on my business too and, and really trying to hone in what's important, Tracy. And I, my highest value is relationship. So my, my goal for everyone listening to this is what are you doing to be rich in relationship how are you being transparent with each other? What are you doing to give each other a sense of hope? And when it all comes together, you're going to have a lot more harmony through understanding. And that's what I want to offer to farm families. So thank you for what you do on this platform. And I listen to Jolene and I listen to Michelle, who are speaker friends of mine. And it's great that we can all work together in agriculture to build the culture that is truly healthy and one that's going to be empowered for future growth. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Elaine. And thank you guys for joining us on another amazing episode. You can pick this book up on Elaine's website. If you go to www.farmmarketer.com, Impact Farming, you'll find all the episodes. And in the show notes, I give links to the books, Elaine's website, where you can purchase it. And just so you guys know, I'm going to be buying copies of Elaine's books to give away to our impact insiders. So you just need to go to that same spot, sign up to become an insider, and you're automatically entered to win any of our giveaways and contests. So if you live on a farm, buy it. Please buy it. Do your farm a favor. Thank you. Like the episode, share it, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.